morning, New City. My name is Tony. The word of God to the people of God this morning. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about forgiveness of many sins. You may be seated. Well, good morning. My name's Gabe. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, thanks for joining us on a, on a holiday weekend. Um, it's going to be an awesome, awesome weekend. I don't know what you have planned, but it's going to be hot. Uh, summer is finally here. Um, well, today is the last uh, message in our series on, on James. Hard to believe. We've gone all the way through. Um, and I don't know about you, but I've just learned a ton um, being, being in this book. I don't think that I've ever really sat through um, a, a series on James before, but there's just so much wisdom, isn't there? So much wisdom that we can uh, apply day in and day out. And so we're going we're gonna to end today um, with, it, it's really a great conclusion to this epistle. Um, you know, we've, we've seen um, the language of James has taught us, you know, how we're to live as Christians in the world, we've entitled the sermon series, How to Get Through What You're Going Through. And it's really this idea that um, there's wisdom that's offered to us that you don't have to invent it. And you certainly don't have to look to the world around you for it, but that God gives it to you generously. Um, and then we just have to apply it. But the way that James ends um, in the two verses that we're going to look at today are really powerful because it ends with this idea that um, you don't apply it alone that you cannot uh, live out the life of Christ alone, that it takes a body, it takes a community, and it takes a, an, an accountable community um, where we are accountable to one another. Um, as I was reading these verses, you know, the theme for me that emerged is a theme of, of being lost, of being lost, because James uses the word wanderer um, in these last two two verses, and so we're going to spend time talking about uh, what it means to be a, a wanderer. Um, and I don't know what your experience of being lost looks like. Um, unfortunately, it's a very common experience for me in my life um, because I have no internal sense of direction, and I get lost everywhere I go. Um, we moved around a lot when I was in the military, and I remember once, like, moving from, we lived in the Seattle um, area for, for a couple of years. Now, uh, to my, you know, to be generous to me, I was gone a lot during that period, but I went back and visited on a work trip several years later, and I thought, you know, I'll just swing by and see our old house, and I couldn't find it because um, I forgot how to, get how, to, how to get to my own house, um, so that's how bad it is. Um, and when I think about being lost, the one, one memory really comes to mind, and uh, that was when I was a young soldier. I was in uh, U.S. Army Ranger School, which is uh, a, it's a really a leadership school where they put you under uh, severe food deprivation, sleep deprivation, and then, like, give you leader tasks to do. And there's uh, a few different components of that. Uh, this particular event happened in the woods outside of Fort Benning, Georgia, and I was leading a patrol at night. And um, I remember I, I put my patrol where they needed to be at night, and then I was, was moving to try to get to the other side of where we were located on the other side of the hill. And uh, I walked out in the woods by myself and lost my way. And I rem I'll never forget the moment that I realized I had no idea where I was. And I was in the woods completely alone at night by myself. Now, I wasn't totally alone. There was a ranger instructor who was following about 15 steps behind me, but they weren't allowed to help you. They were just there to criticize you, which was awesome. Um, and I'll never forget that feeling of just that gut-wrenching, sinking feeling that I'm lost, that I have no idea where I am. And I remember that, that feeling that I was utterly alone. And I remember that the fear crept up over me, like from my feet all the way up to my head. I just felt this fear that enveloped me. And isn't it that what it's like when you're lost? That you're alone and, and you're afraid. You're alone and you're afraid. 
Well, James starts off uh, the verses this morning, my dear brothers and sisters, we're back to familial language. He says, if someone among you wanders, and it's this idea of wandering is, is really synonymous with the idea of being lost, that when you've lost your way, when someone among you loses their way, and he's going to tell us what our responsibility as a community um, is to that person when someone loses their way. And losing our way is such a, a common occurrence in the human condition, isn't it? I don't know what that looks like in your life when you lose your way, but the word here in the Greek really has uh, connotations of like, it's not just a big wandering away from the faith because we tend to think of it that way, right? Like somebody who's really gone off the reservation, like you've really left the truth. You've just rejected Jesus. You've rejected the church. And, and certainly this idea of wandering um, certainly can mean that, but it also means small deviations from the truth. And we're going to talk about a little bit what truth is, but it's in any way when we deviate, when we get off of the path of the truth, um, we're, we wander. And this is central to the human condition because it happened right in the beginning of the story, didn't it? If we look at the one true story uh, that God tells about the world, we go back to Genesis chapter 3, right? God creates the world, Genesis 1 and 2. He says everything's good, and he makes it uh, so that he is with his people, right? He's with the people in the garden, and it's this beautiful existence. And, you know, God deeply desires to be with us. And this is the theme of the story and the gospel. But Genesis 3 um, the people, Adam and Eve, they represent us and they um, go their own way, don't they? They decide to go off of the path. They decide to reject the truth of God, to believe the lie of the serpent. And what happens next? It says, after they sin and they eat the fruit and they reject the way of God, it says that they become overwhelmed with shame and fear. Shame and fear. What is their next action? It says they move and they hide. And they hide. And God asked this penetrating question. He says, where are you? Of course, he knew exactly where they were. But they were hiding. And you remember in the story, they, they, they try to cover themselves with the fig leaf. Um, they try to cover their lostness. But it doesn't work. And the truth is, is we've been hiding and we've been lost and we've been wandering ever since then. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders. Now, if you're like me, you're tempted to read this passage and to begin to think about people in our community or maybe in your larger relational world who you would think of, you know, this, this idea of wandering would apply to this person. You know, it's, it's that person who seems to always lose their way. It's that person who's, uh, you know, irresponsible or foolish. But the truth is, is that we are all wanderers. And as we read this verse, we ought to think of ourselves first. You know, there's the great hymn. When I first read the word wanderer, I, this is the first thing I thought of. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Aren't we all prone to wander? off of the way, we are. It's inherent in us, it's our sin nature that we reject the truth of God and we reject it in big ways and we reject it in small ways. Now there's two uh, categories of people, I think it's important to articulate this when it comes to the idea of wandering. There's uh, the kind of wanderer who's a genuine Christ follower who simply lost their way. And um, you know, I'd be the first to raise, I'll raise two hands to that. Um, it's this idea that we've made a decision to follow Jesus, that we've made that commitment in our life, that we are genuinely a follower of, of the Lord, but that we, we've uh, forgotten the truth. And, and we can do that in big ways and we can do that in small ways. Uh, and there's all kinds of things that can look like. I'll name a few. One is that we forget our identity. We forget our identity. And this is uh, maybe one of the most insidious ways that we, fr that we lose our way and forget the truth um, is that we begin to have our identity, who we are, wrapped up in lies. 
and wrapped up in our own smaller story and wrapped up in the bigger story of the world around us. Every single day, each one of you is tempted to believe an untruth about your identity. The entire world is singing a song to you that says, um, you are not beloved, you are not chosen, you are actually worthless as a human being. You're only as good as what you produce, is what the world tells you, and then we believe it and we wonder, don't we? What happens when we forget our true identity in the Lord? We begin to operate out of a false identity and our relationships suffer as a result. So category one is a genuine Christ follower who has lost their way. Um, and many of us can identify with people in that category. The second is those who have never followed Christ in the first place. And I think one of the reasons that James ends his epistle in this way is that it's, it's an incredibly dangerous thing, maybe the most dangerous thing, to actually think that you're a Christian, to think that you're right with God, but actually you're not. Listen, you're not a Christian because you grew up in a Christian home. You're not a Christian because you're a good person who follows a good moral code. You're not a Christian because you're affiliated with a certain political party. You're not a Christian because you come to church and participate in Christian things. Jesus is clear that you are a Christian, you are a follower of Jesus when you make a decision and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth you make a decision to turn away from your own way, to reject your own way and say, Lord, I wanna follow you, that you are the Lord of my life and I choose to follow you. And I think I've been gripped lately with this distinction of, you know, we're not just called to be a believer. And we use that language. My wife and I were talking about that and we've used that language in our house for a long time that, you know, we're, we're believers and we think about ourselves that way. But actually, you know, what does Jesus say about believing? He says, even the demons believe and they shudder. Jesus, when he starts his earthly ministry, what does he say to the men that he calls? Come and believe in me. Come, come, and, come and join my organization. Come and start behaving differently. No, Jesus says, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You see, there's some sitting here today and maybe you've been in the church and maybe you think of yourself as a Christian, but you've never professed Christ as Lord. And that's the absolute most dangerous place to be. And maybe you're here because your spouse brought you. Maybe you're here because... You know, you enjoy the community and the fellowship, but if you haven't made that decision to turn away from doing life according to your own rules and the way of the world and say, you know what, Lord, I wanna follow you. If you have not made that decision and you're in a dangerous position because you're living a life of wandering, and guess what? The world will celebrate you all the way to hell. They'll clap for you. Good job, you do you your truth, your way. We're all wanderers. We've all strayed from the truth in one way or another. And that's the bad news. That's the bad news that we're wanderers. But James doesn't leave it there and the gospel doesn't leave it there. The verse continues, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth, Conversation part two, there's truth available. You are prone to wonder, but the good news is that there's a truth that's available. Did you know that two thirds of American adults believe there is no such thing as absolute truth? That's a scary thing. This percentage goes up to 74% among people 18 to 25 years old. And this is what the world teaches us, that there is no absolute truth, that truth is what you construct out of your own experience. That's, that's the uh, allure of postmodernism. It's the water that we're swimming in 
as we go to work and we live in our neighborhoods, it's what's being taught in our schools is that you, do, you just do you, you make up your own truth. There is no absolute truth. And how unkind and devastating is that? I wanna go back to my metaphor of, of being lost as an army ranger in the woods. You know, the one saving grace, the way I eventually made myself, got myself out of that bad situation is, is I, had, I had two things. I had two things. Now I had to wait until the morning to use them because it was pitch dark, but I had a map and I had a compass. And, and when you learn to read a map, uh, when you're in the army, it's one of the first things that you learn how to do is you have to have a starting point on your map. If you don't know where you are, when you start navigating, you can never get to where you wanna go. And so I just submit to you this provocative image that when the world says that there is no truth, what they're inviting you to is to live a life where you can never know where you are on the map. And where there's no fixed destination in your future, you go anywhere you want, have fun, be free. How devastating. Can you imagine wandering, wandering in the woods in perpetual darkness forever. If you've ever been stuck in the woods, that's a visceral um, image. And it's the, tr- it's the truth. That's what the world is saying to us. And we've covered it in a veneer of kindness and love. Is saying, let's just love people by saying there's no truth. How unkind and how unloving. And that is not the God that we serve. The God that we serve says there is truth that is available to you. You don't have to be stuck in your wandering. We sing a song that our God is a way maker. The reason I didn't connect uh, before I was out of town this week, we didn't connect on the songs and whatever, but I was actually singing that song I picked that song in my car on the way to church today because it was the song that came to mind as I was thinking about teaching this passage today because it's this idea that there is a way, there's a way, there's a truth. Our God is a way maker. There's an absolute truth that's available and knowable. What is the truth as a Christian? And this is so important, guys. For us, truth is embodied as a person. Truth is embodied as a person. Truth is not just a set set of 691 laws that you have to follow in order to be a good person and earn God's favor. Truth is not a moral code that, you know, if you can just do enough of the right things and you can be good enough and then you'll find your way somehow. You know, truth is a story, right? Right? I love thinking of truth as a story. And that's what the scriptures are. That's my favorite way of thinking about the Bible is that it's a story. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but it's a cohesive story from beginning to end that tells you who God is. It tells you the truth about the world. It tells you the truth about humanity, the truth about who you are. And it's a cohesive, beautiful story And we talked about in Genesis 3 when the the people in the story rebel and decide to go their own way and that just spirals and spirals and spirals and and it continues and it continues even now that this is the way of humanity is that we've rejected God, that we've decided to find our own way and that as a result, we're dying. But God wasn't content with that. He set out on the greatest rescue mission of all time and he entered our world. Can you imagine it? The God of the universe, the God who made the stars of the heavens descended from heaven and he came and he lived among us because he wanted us to know the truth. And it wasn't enough to just send us a book. You know, he tried that first. He wrote some laws on some pieces of stone and gave it to the people, but it didn't work. The people kept rebelling. And then he sent prophets. He sent men and women who would speak the truth. But what did humans do to the prophets? We killed them and we mocked them. And so 
when the books weren't good enough and when the prophets weren't good enough, God came himself. He is the truth. John 14, 6, his name is Jesus and he is the way, the truth, and the life. There's a way to know your starting point on the map. And there's a no, way to know your destination. And, and the way to get from where you are to where God wants you to be is easy. It's a person. We follow Jesus. And as we follow him, our life begins to conform to his life. We begin to do life like Jesus did it and we'll be rejected by the world for it, and we'll be criticized, and we'll suffer. But in the end, we will make our way home. There's a truth, and his name is Jesus. James continues, it's not enough that you just individually realize this truth because you're too sinful for that. I'm too sinful for that too. You see, we'll lose our way even after we've seen him. You th think about the disciples. Think about this. Have you ever thought that, you know, the guys that followed Jesus around for three years, right? They saw him raise people from the dead. They saw him multiply fish and bread and feed people miraculously. They saw him rise from the dead. And then in Matthew 28, this is fantastic. It's just before Jesus returns to the Father and he's sharing a final mandate to his disciples. There's a line that says, some believed and some doubted. And I think that's an important line to remember as the church because seeing Jesus isn't enough all by yourself. You'll lose your way. The world is powerful and you are sinful and that's why James continues, he says, and this is conversation three, is that we're called to bring each other back. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. There's so much in here, but church, it is our collective responsibility to call one another to follow Jesus again. And as I was sitting with this, you know, it, what came to mind is I think so often in the church, we think that is, that is the professional Christian's responsibility. That's the pastor's responsibility. That's the leader's responsibility. But I think what uh, James points to and what the gospel points to is this idea that, no, it's the community's responsibility that we ought to be a community of calling people, calling one another back to the truth. That when we wander, we're not alone. We're, we're with friends who can say, I see you. I see you going the wrong way and I wanna call you back. And it's our sacred responsibility to shepherd one another back. Why? Well, he says here that when, some, when we save someone or we call someone back from wandering, that we save that person from death. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, death threatens us, doesn't it? Death threatens us. Now, if you're someone who's never decided follow, to follow Jesus, then, you know, unfortunately, the consequences for you is that you will suffer eternal death, eternal separation from the Father. But for those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus, and we know that ultimately we will be with him, there is still death that we suffer. And it's death that when we don't live life to its fullest, when we don't live with the power of God, instead we live in a broken way and we destroy our relationships and we live as if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. But that's not the image and that's not the dream for the Christian community. We are to be a light on a hill in a dark world proclaiming the truth of Jesus, calling people to him. So death threatens us. 
And yet we have this sacred responsibility to co-labor with God, to shepherd others back. And as I thought about this, um, a, 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 one story came to mind, and it's probably a familiar story to you, and it's the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. Um, and I want to put a painting up. You, you guys know if, if you've been here a few times since I started speaking, I love art. And I love art because I think essentially the scriptures invite us to see images and that we remember the images far more than we remember the words. Now, this is a rendition of the prodigal son. Um, and this is by a collection of art from Cameroon called uh, Jesus Mafa. And I, I love the paintings of Jesus Mafa because um, they're, they're just great art. But it also reminds us that, you know, the stories that we're reading weren't written to us in our culture. <laughs> they're written to people all over the world, but written to a culture that was much more similar um, to this culture, actually. And so this is um, the, the believers in Cameroon, as they imagine this story unfolding, this is how they saw it. Now, just to recap quickly this story, it's a beautiful story. If you've never heard the gospel before, this is my favorite way of describing the good news of Jesus. So Jesus tells this story and he's talking to the Pharisees, those who um, are all about the rules and the laws, and they don't understand the true story. And they don't understand that the truth is standing before them in the person of Jesus. So Jesus tells them this story and he says, there's a father and he has, he's wealthy and he's a landowner. He has lots of possessions and he has two sons. And one of the sons is a consummate wanderer and, and he's, a, he's a rebel and um, he's disrespectful to his father and he does the most disrespectful thing possible. And he asks for his inheritance before his father dies, which in that culture was extremely offensive. And it was basically saying to his father, you're, you're dead to me. The only reason I care about you is, is because of what I can get from you. And Jesus tells that story because so many of us relate to God that same way, don't we? We live as if God is dead, as if God isn't relevant, as if God has no bearing on our life. It's just, what can I get from him? So Jesus tells this story that the younger son, he, he leaves, he takes, the father gives him the inheritance early and he leaves and it says that the, the young man, he goes and squanders it all. And, and he spends it on wild living, it says he sleeps with prostitutes and you know addiction and just does all the things. And then one day wakes up though, and he wakes up in a, in a, laying in a pig stall in mud and says, what in the world have I done? And a thought comes to his mind as he begins to realize the gravity of his situation that going his own way has led to this life that he never wanted. And he says, maybe if I just go back to my father, maybe he'll take me back as a servant. I, I know he would, he would never take me back as a son because I've done too much. I've wandered too much. I've sinned too much, but maybe he'll take me back as a servant. And so... He picks himself up and with his mud-stained clothes ripped and looking at like he's a man of poverty, he, he goes back home. And the story is beautiful. It says that the father is standing at the end of the, the road, at the end of the, the edge of his property, and he sees his youngest son coming up over the hill. And, you know, you read between the lines and you realize that the story is saying that every day the father got up longing to see his son return home, longing to see the wanderer come back home. He didn't just happen to be at the end of the road and happen to be there. He went there every day because he always was looking, always hoping. And it says that when he saw the young man, he ran to him and he embraced him. And he threw a lavish party and he put fine robes and he gave him the ring, which is basically the bank account. And he says, welcome home, son. And of course, the story is about the heart of God for the wanderer. You see the heart of God, if you're wandering, whether you've wandered in a small way, you've been a follower of Jesus and you've just forgotten the truth about who you are, Maybe you've rejected the ways of God and you've begun to suffer the consequences of that in your life. Maybe that's in your marriage. Maybe that's in your parenting. Maybe that's in your finances. 
I don't know where that consequence is showing up for you right now, but I guarantee whatever it is, is you feel shame. You feel that deep sense in the pit of your stomach, not just that you've done something wrong, but that you are someone who is wrong. You feel like the younger son. And what I want you to hear today is that if you've wandered, there's a God who's waiting for you to come home. The story goes on, there's an older son, the older brother. It says the older brother is self-righteous and indignant and he's angry. He says, I've lived the right way. I haven't wandered at all. And I'm so angry that this guy that wasted everything that you gave him comes home and now you celebrate him and how dare you? And the father rebukes him and says, son, I love you too. But your brother was lost. And now he's found. Let's celebrate together. And the story that we don't talk about a lot is that the correction to the Pharisees and the correction to us today is that we are to be the elder brother. What was the role of the elder brother supposed to be in that story? You see, the father wasn't supposed to leave his house and go find his son but the elder brother was. The elder brother's job was to leave, to leave the comforts of home and to go into that pigsty and to drag his younger brother out and to drag him back home, to remind him of who he was and who he belonged to. And as Jesus is telling that story, the provocative image is that Jesus himself is the older brother. What did Jesus do? He left the kingdom. And he came into the mud and he pulled us out. Now, as James is writing the conclusion to this letter, think about this. Who was his older brother? Jesus. And you see what he's teaching us is that in the community of faith, we are all wanderers. We have all gone astray. We've all forgotten who we are. We've all chosen our own way in small ways and big ways. And it's eating us up and it's destroying us from the inside out. But there's truth to follow. There's a starting point on the map and you're not journeying alone because the community of faith, friends, we are all supposed to be elder brothers for one another. And so what does that look like in the family of God? It means that when we see a person in our community wandering away from the truth in the way that they're living and the thing that they're believing, maybe they've forgotten who they are and they've begun to act out of that and you see their life beginning to be destroyed. You know, our culture just says, whoa, you don't, that's that person's business. Just leave them alone. Just be nice. But the scriptures teach us very clearly that we are to move toward one another, that we're to remind one another of who we are, and that we are to bring gentle and kind and loving correction to one another. Ephesians 4.15, Paul writes, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to be in, become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. If we want to be a mature body, that reflects the love of God to a dying world, then we must call each other back to the way of Jesus. How do we do that? I'll just leave you with this thought, Matthew 18, and this is a whole nother sermon we don't have time to go into today. What does it look like to call one another back? Jesus gives us a template, Matthew 18. I'll go over it briefly. He says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out that offense. So number one, if someone's sinning in our community, our individual obligation is to go and have a conversation, but don't go and have that conversation with the spirit of judgment or go and have it in love, right? With a desire like the heart of the father to bring the person back to the truth. But says, if the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you, go back again, 
so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So how are we to play this out in our community, friends? Is when we see someone among us wandering, we're to go and have a conversation in love and call them back with the love of the Father. But if they reject us and they say, you know what, I don't want to listen to you. How dare you come and say that to me? Who are you to say that? You're just as sinful. If, they get that, if you get that kind of response, it says, take two or three others with you. Why? Is it to pile on and create a coalition against the person? No. It's, it's to make sure that you're seeing correctly, to make sure you don't have blind spots, to make sure that you're loving the right way. And it says, if the person still refuses to listen, you take your case to the church, and then it becomes a matter for the whole community. And this is just how serious Jesus took calling wanderers back. Why? Why? Isn't that offensive? Won't that mean people will leave? Maybe. But remember, the consequences of sin is death. We have to love each other more than that. I want to invite us to conclude in this way. I've written a prayer, which I think I've shared with you. I, I write every week. It's the first thing I do is read the scripture and write a prayer for all of us. And um, I just want to invite us to read this prayer together out loud before we take communion together. Lord, I am a wanderer. I leave the path of beauty, togetherness, and rest. I find myself stuck in a wilderness of my own making, caught up in the thorns of selfish consumption, uncharitable thoughts, and biting words. But I have seen the truth. His name is Jesus. Lord, help me to see him, to hear his voice above the noise of my life. Help me to reject the lies of my heart and of the world. And in Christ's name we pray, amen.